Welcome. So glad that you're here for another episode of The Nonprofit Show. Today's guest is backed by popular demand, Lynn Ruby of Ruby Marketing Agency. And Lynn's here to talk to us about understanding the demographic drought. This is quite a conversation, quite a topic. So I'm really excited to have this with you, Lynn. Um, We are so grateful to, to be here for The Nonprofit Show Julia Patrick, this was her brainchild. I'm so glad that she thought of this back in March of 2020. She roped me in by saying it was going to be a two-week endeavor. Here we are, two and a half, three years later. I'm Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd, CEO of The Raven Group, and I am truly honored to serve alongside Julia in this journey. And of course, we are honored, too, to have the ongoing support of our presenting sponsors. For those of you that are viewing the show, you can see the logos, but those of you listening and tuning in in the auditory space, let me give a shout out to our sponsors. They are Bloomering, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy, Nonprofit Nerd, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, and Nonprofit Thought Leader. Many of these companies have been with us from the very beginning, and they help us produce over 600 episodes. Uh, We are marching towards our 600th episode, so we are between that 500 and 600, but who's counting? And it's been a lot of fun. Um, Again, if you missed any of our episodes or you want to go back and listen to an episode, perhaps this one that we have here with Lynn Ruby. You can find us on Roku, YouTube, Amazon Fire TV, as well as Vimeo. If you're a podcaster like I am, you can also queue up the nonprofit show on your podcast. Lynn, curveball already out the gate. Are you a podcaster? Do you listen to podcasts? I listen to a few podcasts. Do you? I'm more of a reader than I am a listener. I tend to. Oh, turn- yeah. Well, that's that's good to know. I do podcasting when I'm outside, um, you know, walking or, yes. or just, you know, getting some exercise in. So it's good to know. Well, hey, Lynn, I, I have um, already talked you, talked you up uh, in this episode. I'm just so grateful to have you back. And again, I know you and I connected personally on LinkedIn uh, beyond these conversations. So, so glad that you're back. Lynn Ruby, CEO and president of Ruby Marketing Agency. Agency. Welcome back. It's awesome to be here. I love being on the show. It's so much fun. It's so much fun. And you were on previously. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You were on previously. So really glad to have you back again. When we can have a guest come back, have another appearance, it's really good to dive deeper with them. And today's conversation, we are doing just that. So The demographic drought, we're going to talk about this and, you know, this show goes by very quickly. And so we're merely scratching the surface, but I witnessed to you that this show, there's a couple of things that I'm like, what what is that? I don't know. Like, so I am here as our viewer and listener right alongside them saying, teach me, educate me, tell tell me what you're working in. Um, So let's let's dive right in there. Talk to us about this demographic drought. And again, share with us a little bit about the past workforce. And again, for those of you watching, we have on the screen here, past workforce, boomers, retired, they did not replace themselves. So let's dive deep, Lynn. Let's dive as deep as we can in the time that we have. So a little bit of background first. I discovered um, a report called the Demographic Drought not too long ago, and it was a 40-page statistical report. I am not a statistics person. I'm not a math person. I'm not a numbers person. And yet, I read this report through and was all 40 pages and was trans. I was like, wow, this is really important information that a lot of people need to know whether they're in business or just for their personal lives. And I was just really struck by the challenge of it and the optimism of it too, that I could see in it. So um, I wanna dive a little bit as much as we can into three main points that this report stood out to me for. And first is um, that, well, well, you know, we're talking about the great resignation, right? And okay, everybody's resigning from their jobs, all that's happening. And there seems to be an underlying assumption that, you know what, at some point, the great resignation is going to be over and we'll be back to somewhat what we call normal. We'll be doing hybrid stuff and all that still, but you know, it'll, it will write itself. And when I read this report, I realized, ooh, I don't think so. And the subtitle of this report is called The Coming Sans-demic. Sans, the word S-A-N-S, meaning without. Yes, lack of. Uh Demic, meaning people, without people. 
And then this report proceeded to go into all of the statistical facts and the things that are happening globally that are causing this coming pandemic. And I was like, wow, this goes way beyond the great resignation. So let's start with, and this has been happening way before the pandemic. And as with everything else, the pandemic accelerated it. So let's take a look at the past first, the um, past workforce, we'll call it, although <laughs> it's not entirely past, the boomers. The boomers were this huge, as you know, this huge population that came about and were a huge influence on our current workforce. And at the time that they were in charge, we'll call it, they created the way things should be in the work world, right? And that way was you were loyal to your company, you come in and you work and they will be loyal back to you. And as we know, that has all changed dramatically. And what happened with the boomers is that they are now retiring in record numbers. Of course, they're at that age, right? And what happened was normally 2 million boomers retire per year. In 2020, with the pandemic, that soared to 3 million. So Whoa. that means that there is a whole lot of knowledge and expertise and experience that is leaving in mass, right? And companies are being left with, wait a minute, all this knowledge left and, and now what? So, so Lynn, let, let me just clarify, this is a national report, correct? Or is this international? This is an international report. Three million international boomers. Oh, I'm sorry, for this statistic, the, the statistic is US. Okay, so you, the whole US is, is international. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, you had said, you know, that you're not a numbers person, math person. I'm not either. You know, I shook my head. I was like, nope, not me neither. Yeah. But you've already, these are sobering statistics that I'm like, they are, my jaw. <laughs> they are sobering and get ready for more. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. The boomers retired are retiring and in that process. And that was speeded up by the pandemic. Yeah. So also another thing the boomers did was they did not replace themselves. What I mean by that is on average, the parents of the boomers, which were the greatest generation, right? Uh, on average had four children per family. And the boomers on average had less than two. They had 1.8 children per couple. So they didn't replace themselves. Okay, so there's fewer people to replace those massive boomers who are retiring. Okay, so that, then, yeah. Is amazing. And, and I think of my own life, right? And we were sharing about this earlier. I have one kid. I'm a one and dunner. <laughs> Me too. I was like, oh, guilty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I'm adding to that statistic as we get to my age. So yeah, one and dunner here. So sorry, but yeah. anyway. Yeah. So then in 2016, some of you may be aware of this, some not, but in 2016, which was not that long ago, the millennials, the generation behind the boomers actually became the largest generation in the workforce. So it's, the workforce is no longer predominantly the boomers, which it was for so long. It is now predominantly the millennials who have a much different, um, have a much different as, or outlook on work, as we all know, right? And then in addition to that, the boomers were very, very wealthy. They are retiring with lots of money and they are leaving lots of money to their children. So boomer children, the children of boomers are set to inherit about 68 uh, trillion with the T dollars by 2030. So they are going to be the wealthiest generation in history. I've heard of this uh, and make, make sure that I, I'm right in this land as the silver tsunami, right? And so really right. looking at the boomers, um, you know, all of their, their money, the inheritance is then being passed on in large force to their inheritance. And this is really this huge transference of wealth, right. and um, which is exciting and a little scary. It is a little scary because not only are they transferring a huge amount of wealth, they're transferring, transferring it to fewer people because they had fewer children. Right. Which means that there's even more, you know, each child gets even more of that pie, if you will. And 
what does that do to, they saw what their parents went through, their companies were not necessarily loyal to them, they're generating, they're inheriting all this wealth, they are much less motivated to work. Sure. Generation word, right? Yeah. So there's fewer of them, they're less motivated to work and they're radically different in their perspective of what work is all about. So that's, that's, that's what we'll call the past. The past. The past. Okay. That's that is fascinating. And, and I, I probably skipped ahead, but, you know, looking at our present, so the millennials are still present. They're still part of our workforce. As you said, they're starting to inherit some of this, some of this wealth. Um, and they're also looking at with the great resonation, the great reshuffle, however we want to talk about this, really looking at what's important to them. And I'm curious, Lynn, if you can share with us, what is important to our present workforce? You shared, you know, this phenomenal, fascinating report. It's very eye-opening and (laughs) jaw-dropping. What are you seeing with our present workforce? What is our audience, our workforce wanting, needing, and how are they engaging? What's important to them? So what's important is um, meaning, a purpose in their work, and flexibility. And when you think about the, the culture of the boomers and what they put in, that was not there at all. It was work hard for work hard's sake and be loyal for loyalty's sake and make a lot of money. And that's not necessarily what the millennials and the generation that follows it are, is important to them. They, you know, for the large part, they don't have to worry about money. Um, and they're looking for meaning and purpose in their work, as well as flexibility, whether that's, you know, hybrid um, working from home, working in the office or totally high or totally uh, remote work or flexible hours and support from their from their employers for their life in addition to their work life, not just their work life. Yeah. You know, I- I'm not a millennial, but I'm right on the cusp, right? And so really looking at what is important to me. uh, And when I hear the word success, for me, that definition has changed over my years. Sure. And, you know, looking at not only my income, but my quality of life, my, my present time, my current engagement with my family, so important to me. And I have said these words out of my mouth, Lynn. You couldn't pay me a million dollars to take that contract, (laughs) right? Now, when it comes down to it, I really don't know if someone wanted to give me a million dollars, if I truly would take that contract, but I have found this balance and it waxes and wanes, you know, but really determining what is important. How do I want to spend my years? And for me, my why freedom, flexibility, and travel I want the freedom to do what I want, when I want the flexibility to have that option. Right. And, you know, to travel, travel is a really big thing for me. So, uh, as a present workforce, -er, you know, being part of that, that's important to me. Are you seeing that also, you know, when we look at, um, assessing and maybe reassessing during this time, what our present workforce is, is looking uh, for and are they negotiating, renegotiating? So yes, yeah, so employers um, are having to, whether they want to or not, some of them are doing it kicking and screaming and some of them are doing it um, gladly and happily, is reevaluating how they hire, who they hire, um, and what kind of benefits and flexibility and purpose that they give to those that, that they um, provide for those employees and valuing them so much more, so much more than in the past. Um, now, if we want to talk about, um, there's also something going on now that I think is pretty um, astounding. And that is that um, presently women um, in from February, 2020 to February, 2021, 2.4 million women left the workforce. Now, of course, this was um, impacted by the pandemic, doubtless, right? Who has primary caregiving responsibility for children? The women. And the children were at home having to do homeschooling. So with that fault fell on the women to do that. In addition, a lot of predominantly female employee um, employment areas like hospitality and service oriented are women primarily. So the nonprofit women- sector. I mean, I would love to know there has to be Um, you know, a gender uh, study out there, but most of the nonprofits that I've worked with, Lynn, across the nation 
are predominantly women. And, you know, for me as a working mom, I'm so very grateful that my son's dad also, you know, was very present during the pandemic Uh, and we're still in it, right? Like, I don't want to dismiss it. I know we're still having that impact. Um, And I do know that a lot of my friends, you know, uh, they left the workforce as that primary caregiver became uh, the uh, homeschool kind of, you know, person. And I am just so grateful that I was able to find a way through it. It wasn't easy. It definitely wasn't easy. But that number that you just shared, and that was a year. So February 2020, February 21, that's a huge uh, sands, if you will. (laughs) That's a big change. Yes, yes. And then there was something else going on with the males in the workforce that actually started way back in 1980, which I found fascinating and also sobering. I'm sorry to be so sobering this morning, but um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the report actually says, where have all the men gone? Because the prime age male workforce fell 94% from 1980 to, to 2019. And that's over 3 million missing male workers from the workforce. So that was starting way back in 1980. And, and where are they? So I'll tell you where they are. <laughs> Where, where have the men gone? <laughs> so in 2014, for the first time since 1880, 1880, more men, 25 to 34 years old, were living with their parents than they were with a spouse. So they're not getting married. And then also 13% of millennials didn't get their, millennial men didn't get their first job until the age of 20 plus, okay? And um, they are willingly opting out and doing part-time work rather than full-time work. And they're also they're also um, being very much wooed away by video games, surprising, and opioids. The opioid endemic had a really negative impact on male participation in the workforce. Wow. So um, that's that makes me sad. Um, both of those those facts, and um, and so we're losing the men also, and th- that together just creates yeah challenges. What about the gig economy? Has that taken an impact? As when I heard you say, you know, the men specifically in the part time roles, I think of a gig economy. I think right. of you know we can start looking at uh, shifting our schedule, becoming our own boss, choosing when we work, where we work, how we work. And I'm curious, maybe the study mentioned this, but if you can just speak to it a bit, you know, that gig economy, because I've also heard, Lynn, that it's normal now to have a gap in your resume that includes a Lyft or Uber or some other kind of gig economy job. Right. That is perfectly normal. It's no longer frowned upon, right? That right. trying to get hired in your resume has that kind of gap. So I would, uh, this report does not specifically mention the gig economy, but to me, it's only natural to assume that um, that part-time work includes the gig economy of all types, whether that's you know part-time consulting or doing Zoom or Uber or Lyft on the side. And yeah. that, you know, and, and if you think about the mindset of this generation, you know, it's not imperative that they have to support a family because they're not getting married, they're not having kids, and they're living at home, and they've got all this wealth that they're set to inherit. So there's not much of a motivation to get out and really be, um, you know, proactive in a, quote, standard career. Yeah, that is fascinating. So I, I don't mean to drop the ball on you here, but what is our current unemployment rate? And I don't know if you know this nationally, but, you know, as I think about this this workforce that is not present, right? I mean, they exist, but they're not present. They're not working. They're not choosing to work this full-time capacity. So what are we doing with the unemployment rate versus the individuals that are just simply not motivated to to be in this full-time, you know, work environment? Right. And, you know, I don't, I I don't want to say a number because I can't recall the latest one that I read, but that's a very good question. Yes. And so, I mean, we know the unemployment rate is relatively high because we're all talking about the great resignation and um, where are all the people. And so, you know, these are statistics that back that up for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, the unemployment rate changes so, so very much. So we've talked about the past. We've talked about the present. Now, the future workforce, life below 2.1 globally, 
What, what is this? What does that mean? Yes. So when we think about the future, remember I said in the beginning that there's kind of this underlying assumption that, oh, we're in this period of the great resignation, but we're going to come out of it. We'll be okay afterwards, mm -hmm. right? And that may not necessarily, we're going to have to readjust how we think about everything because this is going to affect not only employers, but how to get, when we get services from businesses as, as consumers, when we go to the hospital and we want to be treated by a doctor or a nurse. So it's going to affect the entire world. So when I say 2.1, 2.1 is the rate at which every woman needs to have a child, 2.1 children, in order to keep the population steady not to grow the population. That takes into account, you know, childhood death and so forth. So sure. 2.1 is the rate at which ch women need to have children globally in order to keep the population steady. And we are, as I mentioned, the what were the um, 1.8 is what the boomers did. Right. And we think, okay, well, you know what? There's lots of other countries that want to, people from other countries that want to come to the U.S. So let's just get people there to come here and then we'll be fine. Okay. Yeah. And I'm thinking of other solutions too, because uh, again, I'm staying a one and done Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when we look at the um, like immigration and other countries that might want to immigrate here, Mexico in particular, their fertility rate has been falling for 50 years. Their um, replacement rate is now at 2.12. So that's barely above keeping Just, Yeah. Yes. Uh, Japan, Spain, Italy, Central and Eastern Europe have already stopped growing. So they're below 2.1. Wow. Um, when we look at um, the employment status in other countries, Mexico has been struggling with talent shortages since 2018. 63% of companies in India have talent shortages and China is struggling to fill jobs, especially with skilled workers. So some of the places that we might look to to replace our declining population are also in decline. In fact, I um, have a colleague who does business primarily in Japan. Japan is about 10 to 15 years ahead of us in terms of their population growth. So they, um, and their population growth is declining. And she tells me when she's over there, all she sees is old people, old people everywhere. And they're only about 10 to 15 years ahead of us. So it's a sobering statistic and it's a sobering report. And also I found hope in the ending of this report because they talked about the fact that the bottom line is value people more. And that really spoke to my heart because, gosh, have we been taking people for granted all these years? It's time to value them more and value your employees more, value every child born more, value every student in colleges more because um, we need people in order to sustain our level of living and in order to sustain um, ourselves as healthy populations. So that was, that was my hope at the end of this. I had to take a deep breath because when you said value people more, that is such a simplistic, humane statement, right? right. Um, and, and it's really important. And I'm thinking, and, and thank you, honestly, because that's, that's what I needed to hear. Hopefully what many of our viewers and listeners needed to hear. We've been talking a lot about how do we retain our workforce? How do we... Um, you know, have stay interviews instead of exit interviews? How do we pay in a competitive, you know, comp compensative way? Um, because my first thought honestly was, maybe we look at our child labor laws and say, how soon is too soon to work? <laughs> But that's clearly not the answer. The answer is to value people more um, and, and looking at, you know, are we providing that balance of purpose and passion and personality and really looking at the, per, the whole person? Um, I, I'm curious, and we don't have too much time here, just about five minutes. Where does artificial intelligence and because honestly, when I when I see this this slide, and for those of you listening, it really looks like a robot hand. And I'm thinking, okay, now we're moving into this 2.1 global being 
you know, kind of the robot era. We have self-driving cars um, at the local university here. We have food being delivered by little robots. Um, you know, drinks at fast food stations are now poured solely by, you know, um, a computer, not a hand anymore. So where does that fit into the, into the mix? You know, that's a fascinating question because I think a lot of um, thoughts will automatically, well, you know what, we, we have so much technology, let, you know, for a large part of this, let's just implement AI of some sort so that we can overcome this lack of people. So there's two, two, two issues with that. Um, one for me, and this is my personal opinion, I do not believe that um, implementing AI is always the, an the best answer because mm -hmm. there is just something about human interaction that is so valuable because we talked about value people more. That is <laughs> incredibly valuable. So I think AI and technology has a place in solving this problem. Um, the other issue, however, is that when we have a whole lot fewer people and we have a whole lot fewer skilled people, we have fewer technically advanced folks to implement and create and develop this AI to begin with. So there's a, you know, there's two sides to this. We want to value people more and we want to use AI as much as we can, but we have less people to develop that AI. Uh, mm -hmm. and that technology. So isn't that fascinating um, that, uh, that yes, AI is part of the answer, but I am so much more inspired by the value people more um, aspect than by, oh, let's just implement technology to solve all our problems because it's not going to solve all our problems. It's, it's not. And for me, I think of AI is more, how might we reconsider or consider um, our processes, right? Like where might we find efficiencies? And there still needs to be that human connection, especially as a professional fundraiser, you know, uh, we, we really need to have that. So Lynn, fascinating information, phenomenal conversation. You have left me with so very much to think about. And I know our viewers and listeners the same. Lynn Ruby, CEO and president, Ruby Marketing Agency. Now you are being very generous. You are sharing your email here, Lynn, L-Y-N-N -N, at lynnruby.com. You are sharing this with us. Is that right? The research that you just shared? Yes. So if anyone would like to email me and just say, I'd like a copy of that demographic drought report, I'll be glad to send it to you along with a uh, one sheeter that we have developed of ways to um, address the, sand, the coming sands demic from our perspective. Um, and that is always, I think the bottom line is value people more of whatever form that takes. It might take the form of AI, it might take the form of different customer service, it might take the form of flexibility and hybrid and all of that. Who knows what all it's going to take, yes. but the bottom line is value people more. I didn't even know sans-demic was a word. So I, <laughs> and I just have to share before we sign off here, one of our viewers said this is beyond fascinating, beyond in all caps. We will definitely be rewatching this. So thank you uh, very much for, awesome. for being here, for sharing this information, Lynn. It definitely uh, landed with many of our viewers. So, so thank you so much for that. And for those of you uh, that are watching, glad to have you here. Again, you know, Julia, Patrick, and I come on every single weekday, the only nonprofit national webcast and also podcast, thanks to our sponsors that are Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy, Nonprofit Nerd, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, and Nonprofit Thought Leader. Please check out these companies. They are fascinating. They value people and we can all value people more. I'm taking that away, Lynn. So thank you so very much for that. And, um, and thank you for being here. It's, it's our uh, grateful honor to have your voice and, and thought leadership. So thank you. Yeah, and for all of you that joined us either live or watching this recording, because I know many of you will press replay, please join us again tomorrow. And until then, stay well so you can do well. Thanks, Lynn.